and good evening to everyone uh, who's managed to be able to make it for this live presentation on basically a comprehensive sort of view an overview of endoscopic pituitary surgery and we've tried to encompass a little bit of sort of basic stuff as well and not just surgery so it's it's really a good sort of starting point for a person starting off with uh, pituitary surgery or wants to understand the concepts of pituitary surgery so uh, of course this talk is is both from my side as well as the department of neurosurgery with, with whom i work very closely we work with about uh, 10 or 11 neurosurgeons at bombay hospital and uh, also a couple at bridge candy hospital right so let's getting on to the topic itself now of course we know that the pituitary gland is is what you call the master gland of the body and controls a lot of your important endocrine functions it does lie sort of in the center of the head cradled in the cella turcica and consists of essentially two parts the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe and it's sort of compacted between two layers of dura so that when you cut one layer you're at the pituitary you don't get a csf leak unless you go through the back layer a uh, difference in in embryology of course is that the anterior is from the rathke pouch or the oral ectoderm whereas the posterior is sort of a direct neural extension of the third ventricle right so the pituitary hormones that are released are basically mainly produced by the anterior lobe or the adenohypophysis and that go through the vascular system and that's controlled to a big extent by the hypothalamic neurohormones and uh, the posterior part is the neurohypophysis which really is is a uh, an extension of neurons or extension of axons that come all the way from the hypothalamus down into that part of the gland what is the uh, blood supply so the anterior part will get its blood supply mainly from the superior hypophysial posterior from the inferior hypophysial and they form a capillary plexus a sort of a venous portal plexus by which hormones are delivered and drained out of the pituitary and that's how your feedback uh, occurs right so the gland itself again anterior part secretes most of the hormones which are growth prolactin acth tsh lh fsh so these are your most important uh, secreting hormones another thing to classify the pituitary gland is tumors of course of the uh, pituitary gland are can be benign or malignant 99% is benign malignant is very rare the other way to do it is to do it with either chromophobic or chromophilic now your chromophobic cells will give rise to non functioning adenomas whereas your chromophilic again is divided into two the basophilic and the acidophilic basophilic will produce these hormones so it will give you typically like a cushing's or thyroid or adenomas whereas the acidophilic will give you uh, acromegaly or prolactinomas you may also have mixed tumors and not very common are men tumors which is basically a uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 is seen more common in in the pituitary thyroid and the pancreas and these are tumors of the endocrine system right so this is a nice chart to give you an overview of of everything that the pituitary does so here you have your list of hormones what they are also known as the structure of it the secretory cells so it's corticotrophs will give you corticosteroids thyroid thyroid hormones etc the the cell with which it sort of uh, stains and the effect and over secretion of course will give you whether it's cushing's or thyroid or acro or prolactinoma right so this gives you an overview i'll just give you a minute to sort of take it all in and we we'll go then to the next right so 
when we come to treatment of adenomas, what are your options? Like in any tumor, you have medical and surgical options. For prolactinomas, our medical options are the mainstay of treatment. And that would be cabagoline, bromocriptine, or quinagolide. Usually it's cabagoline. For Cushing's and acromegaly, though you have this list of medical treatment, the medical treatment is not very effective. And therefore, we would use it sort of sparingly. And we would then go to surgery. So when do we do surgery for adenomas? One, of course, is to alleviate symptoms, whether they are because of secretory or because of size, because of a mass effect causing problems with headaches or vision or cranial nerve involvement. Occasionally, you may have difficulty in diagnosis. So you may have a granuloma, a lymphoma, a Rathke's pouch cyst, a Rathke's uh, cyst, things like that. You know, you had even like a cranio that looked like a, a pituitary. So sometimes you just want to do surgery to make a diagnosis. Is it hypophysitis? Is it an adenoma? Then we come to a biochemical cure. And a biochemical cure is, of course, for those people that who have a uh, secretory tumor. And for them, it makes, you can remove the tumor and give them a cure. Or if you remove a vast big part of the tumor, then you can make the medical treatment more effective. While doing surgery, of course, you want to reserve and or restore normal gland and, and function. So when I say restore it, it's because sometimes with large adenomas, it compresses the normal part of the, the normal gland. It sort of stretches it and compresses and many of these patients will then have hypopituitism. And by taking away that big part of the tumor, you're then allowing that, that residual part of the gland to start functioning again. Avoid complications both during surgery. So when you do surgery, you don't want to give add morbidity to the patient. And at the same time, by doing surgery, you prevent complications from further tumor growth. So if the tumor were to continue growing, for example, into the uh, cavernous sinus, then you would see uh, a little bit of cranial nerve involvement or very large tumors would then give extra headaches, etc. And three again is if you have a big tumor and you've removed most of it and you have a little bit left, for example, in the cavernous sinus, you can then give radiotherapy in a safer manner because you don't have to then uh, radiate a large part. Right, so what are the indications? Uh, definite indications, non-secretory tumors with mass symptoms, which include hypopituitarism, as we just discussed. Most GH and Cushing's and thyroid adenomas because they don't respond very well to medical treatment. And whether there's a bleeding in the tumor, like an apoplexy, especially if it is symptomatic. But you also have to keep in mind that if you had one apoplexy, you can have another one in future and, and an apoplexy can suddenly crash a patient. So that could be uh, the more definite indications. Prolactinoma, which is not responsive to medical treatment or if the patient prefers it, and we'll come to that in the next slide. In patients which we can wait or we can observe is asymptomatic non-secretory with no mass effect unless on subsequent CT scans or subsequent MRIs, it shows serial growth. So if it is showing growth, then we would say, let's hold it and let's wait. And most prolactinomas uh, will get medical treatment. Almost always you'll start with medical treatment with, with a prolactinoma unless the patient says, get it out of my head. Right, when do you not want to operate? Of course, if the patient is unfit for surgery, so whether there's a cardiac issue or, or whatever reason. If there is a security uh, problem, which is uncontrolled, and we must get an endocrinologist, you must get an endocrinologist involved in all security pituitary tumors, both for pre-op and post-op. I would suggest that you do an endocrinological evaluation for any pituitary tumor, even if it's non-secretory, for the chance or possibility of them having DI or uh, uh, hypopituitarism post-operatively. So again, if there's hypopit, then profound hypopit, you want to stabilize the patient prior to surgery. Active sinus infection is not a good idea to operate for the simple reason that you're going intracranially 
And if you do have a CSF leak, you then considerably increase the chance of getting meningitis. So you must treat this patient adequately with antibiotics, clear the infection, and then go in with surgery. And finally, if there's a very ectatic tumor, it's going, for example, the middle cranial fossa or much lateral to the carotids. The carotids are not got displaced laterally. They're encased or tortuous in the way. Then, of course, uh, not a good idea to do it endoscopic. Right, so let's go more specific uh, with the security tumors initially. So prolactinomas are one of your most common adenomas, accounting for more than 30%. More common in, in the young uh, uh, woman. Uh, it can lead to hypogonadism and almost always will get medical treatment. So when do we operate on prolactinomas? So you started patients on medical treatment, but their prolactin remains high. It doesn't go down. They have persistent neurological symptoms due to the size being large. So it hasn't responded in, in size either. And there are other side effects or complications of, of uh, medical treatment. Finally, the patient on treatment wants to get pregnant and you need to stop treatment. Also, if there are any acute symptoms or the patient, as we mentioned earlier, just wants some, there are some patients who don't want to take medical treatment for a sustained period of time and, and doesn't feel comfortable with the tumor in the head. So, so it tells you that, take it out. So very few indications, very small subgroup of patients in prolactinoma who will need surgery. Unlike that on Cushing's, almost always we would like to operate uh, lots of problems. So some of the information on these slides I have uh, taken from uh, lectures given by other people. For example, Rohan uh, had given this talk at Wheel Corning, Cornell. And just a, a little uh, note for him there. So uh, Cushing's, of course, you diagnose on clinical suspicion, patients putting on weight, doesn't respond to other things, et cetera. From the blood test, you know your hormonal assays and on radiology, you see the tumor. Now it's not always easy to see a tumor with Cushing's. Very often they're very small tumors on the edge. And there is doubt sometimes about whether there's a tumor or not. And even if there's a tumor on which side it is, so you would then want to do an IPS sampling if there is a doubt about which side and that will show you that there's more secretion on the left or the right. And accordingly, you need to locate or look for tumor on that side. And if you're not able to find it, you just go ahead and do a hemiphysectomy on that side. Despite that, if the hormonal level still stays high, you have to think that maybe it wasn't coming from the cella and maybe from the adrenals or some other side. Or you can go back in if you're sure it's from the cella and go ahead and do a, a complete hypophysectomy because it's easy to, easier to replace than try and control it. Or you have the option of radiotherapy. Right, so finally look at Cushing's. Pre-op, watch out for obesity and OSA and, and be careful uh, of, of anesthesia in regards of this. Intra-op, there's always difficulty in locating the tumor. These microadenomas with Cushing's, more often than not, I would say, are on the lateral extent, so very close to cavernous sinus. And it's not uncommon to get bleeding from the cavernous. And if it's a small adenoma, you're searching there and you have bleeding from the cavernous, it may come and go without you even realizing it, that you've taken it out. And therefore, uh, sometimes histology also becomes a problem. However, the results of surgery, as you can see, are, are good. So for example, in microadenomas, it's over 90% on average. Whereas for macro, it's a little less. And as the grade goes higher, the results drop a little bit, but more or less, it's good. If your levels have not gone down, of course, you have the option of reoperating, as we mentioned earlier, or doing an adrenalectomy, or doing radiotherapy or medical options. So let's go from there to acromegaly. So if you have GH, which happens in the puberty age group, then you'll get gigantism, but in the adult, it'll lead to acromegaly. So for these patients, uh, because of the increased tongue size, facial features, etc., they also will have OSA, but it also does affect the heart and it can cause cardiomyopathy and one must always get a cardiac fitness for these patients. Uh, what affects the results? And you can get uh, tumors uh, with uh, uh, growth hormone secreting, which are very large. So the grade of NOSP will decide whether you get a good outcome 
whether you've got a GTR, a gross total resection or not. And then of course the size. So the results are a little poorer as you can see as compared to Cushing, but overall about a 60 to 80 percent remission. Now, if you're giving radiotherapy, then of course, there are many people who say like, you know, surgery is difficult, it's in the cavernous sinus, why are, we, why are we bothering all it's failed surgery, inserting revision to radio. So yes, radio is a viable option, but one must consider that there are some issues that can happen with radio. Uh, 50, uh, at five years, 60, up to 60% will have hypopit. Neuropathy uh, for the optic nerves, fortunately, is very low because today radiotherapy is very precise and can be uh, managed without damage to the nerves. And uh, hypofractionated um, uh, SRS is good local control, but somehow it doesn't uh, reflect in biochemical cures. So from there, we come to surgical anatomy. So of course, you know, the pituitary is in the center of the head and let's come straight away. So we start with the nose or with the sinus. Uh, in the sphenoid sinus, you, have, you can get multiple sin uh, septations. As you see here, you can get sphenoethmoidal uh, cells or ONOD cells. And it's very important that you have good imaging. Now, whilst we know that MRI must be the gold standard for intracranial pathology, and we, we have to rely on a good MRA, especially if you have microadenomas, uh, to differentiate between tumor from other pathologies. Uh, it is equally essential to have a CT scan. And we do that just normally of the paranasal sinuses, because that is our route to get into the nose. So we want to rule out sinuses, deviations, uh, sorry, sinusitis deviations, or little difficult anatomy, such as these septations, pneumatization of the sphenoid. So a lot of valuable information that one can get, whether it's a lie of the skull base, you know, whether it's a descending or an ascending skull base, uh, so that we can sort of plan the surgery a little better. Once you are in the sphenoid sinus, uh, for me, this is one of the most important uh, figures or photos that you can look at. Because if you, if you look at this cell eye uh, as the dial of a clock, then at 12, you will have the tuberculum, which lies more or less sort of between the optic nerves at the junction of planum and the upper part of the cella. Uh, at the lateral part of the tuberculum, the lateral tubercular recess, you have the median OCR, which is the closest point of the optic nerve with the clenoidal part of the carotid. Laterally, at about two o'clock, you will have the lateral OCR, which is a little depression of the optic strut between the uh, carotid and the optic. Of course, the optic nerve you'll see at about one o'clock. And then at between two, three, and four, you have the carotid, the clenoidal carotid and the cavernous part of the carotid. And then down at five o'clock from the cella, you will have the clival carotid. At six, of course, is the clivus, and then the same sort of structures are reflected on the opposite side. And for me, the importance of this figure is that sometimes there is tumor on one side, there's pathology, the pneumatization is not good, and we don't see landmarks as clearly as you can see in this, in this figure. So if you don't have this very clear anatomy, and if you have even the you know, identification of one landmark, so you see the left optic nerve, then just based on that, I know where my tuberculum is, I know where my cella is, I know where the carotids are, and I know where the opposite side, where the structures are going to be. So it really helps you to define and, and plan how your surgery is going to go. So this is just a close-up of, of this area, showing you the lateral and the median OCR, optic carotid in relation to the cella. So if you were to go between the cavernous, into the cavernous, you will see the uh, ICA and the optic. Normally, of course, you don't enter into the area, you'll just get a lot of blood and it, it would be uh, hazardous to the cranial nerves. And you would see the, the medial wall of the carotid sinus when you do a pituitary. To signify the end of tumor removal, this is what you would see with the impression of the carotid artery through the wall. Uh, and you'll see, of course, the top, the diaphragm. So let's say we're going in now. 
we've taken a bit of the diaphragm out in this case because it was a cranio and now we're seeing intracranial anatomy so inferiorly is the pituitary gland and the stalk you have the optic nerves on both sides with the chiasm and above that you have the anterior cerebral complex so you'll have a1 a com a2 with the rubna artery of rubna and as we go laterally you will see the relation of the optic nerve with the internal carotid artery and you see that they're quite closely sort of approximated and we also see a very important artery called the anterior hypofacial artery coming off the carotid here and supplying important tributary or important uh, branches to the optic nerve the chiasm and the stalk and hence it's it's important when you're doing any supracellular approach to maintain these perforators and these branches of the AHA. This is the opposite side carotid and the optic. Another view post uh, surgical excision, again, crane, uh, not sure this was a cranial or a pit, but you can see right up with an angle scope into the foramen of Monroe, you see the corpus callosum, you see the choroid plexus, and you see the third ventricle. So this is the kind of view that you can get as high as you can get. Uh, when you have an extended approach and sometimes with an angle scope. And then laterally, you'll see, of course, the anterior and the posterior cerebrals and the middle cerebral would come from there. So that would then be your entire circle of willis. And inferiorly, you'll see the basilar, the superior cerebellar, the posterior cerebrals, and the third cranial nerve that comes between them, sitting all this sitting on, on the pons uh, below. Right, so again, let's just look at cadaver dissections, uh, just to give you a little anatomy before we go in. So this gives you very clearly the carotid as it comes from a parapharyngeal and then ascends into a clival, into a cavernous, into a clenoidal. So these are your proximal and distal dural rings. And just above that will run your carotid artery. This is the, sorry, the, run the optic nerve and internally will run the optic nerves here as well. So uh, this is then your stalk. These are your branches of the anterior hypofacial artery. This is your pituitary gland itself. And you'll have, of course, similar on the other side. So if you look at this picture, clivectomy is done. You see the entire gland with the stalk. You see the basilar and the pons. And you see the quadrification into the SCA, PCA, and the third nose, which run between the branches with the ACA above. Right, so coming to the tumor itself, uh, usually people tend to follow the NOSP Steiner classification and uh, it, it works like this. So if you look at the, the carotid artery, okay, as it surrounds the, uh, as on either side of the pituitary gland, and if you draw a line from here to here, then on grade zero, so there are three lines. First, let's look at the line, the median line, the medial line, a median line and a lateral line. Okay, so medial, median, and lateral. Grade zero when the tumor doesn't cross the median line. Grade one is when it crosses the medial but not the median, which runs through the carotid. Grade two is when it crosses the median but not the lateral. Grade three is when it crosses the lateral carotid line. And grade four is when there's en encasement of the carotid artery. So that's the NOSP uh, Steiner classification. Uh, this is me spending some time with uh, Professor NOSP himself. Uh, this was in uh, March last year. And Professor was kind enough to take me for a walk through his favorite places in uh, Vienna. So just talk about a little bit of surgical and surgical history. Uh, these are the various incisions that were used prior uh, transfacial incisions that we started off with Schlofer and then we also had a sublabial and, and, and very rarely these approaches are still used today. You know, uh, some, some neurosurgeons who use microscopy still prefer a sublabial. I know one surgeon who still uses a transethmoid, for example. So Schlofer was one of the first people to start doing in more than 100 years ago. Harvey Cushing is a, is a very big name. Uh, his student, Normal Dot, and his student, Gio, also did significant modifications and, and uh, progress of pituitary endonasal surgery. 
and hardy was the one who really added the microscope and therefore gave it much better illumination and, and exposure by using a speculum uh, to do pituitary surgery right so we come to today we have to thank these people but let's come to today to do pituitary surgery to, to do any skull based surgery it's extremely important to have a team approach and i cannot emphasize this enough but we would never do a pituitary surgery without a team approach of course the neurosurgeon and the ent form the core of the team but you also have a neurologist endocrinologist eye do ophthalmic surgeons you can have associated surgeons like a plastic reconstructive depending on on what you need to do but core team a neuroanesthetist an intensivist and then a good radiologist and also an interventional radiologist so these are the most important aspects of a good team apart from having a multi speciality hospital a uh, properly equipped uh, operation theater and a neuro uh, icu please remember that pituitary surgery though when you see experts doing it looks easy is not always easy and you can get significant life threatening complications so what are the advantages of a team approach you get different viewpoints from different members of the uh, specialties you have an extra set of eyes so whilst one person is concentrating on on one aspect the somebody is looking at the periphery looking at a different different uh, anatomy and warning you about your closeness or possibility of a problem a different priorities again for example uh, the neurosurgeon when he operating he wants to remove more bone he wants more exposure he wants to make it easier for him to remove the tumor for the ent you want to restrict their exposure you want less bone removal you want to make the reconstruction easier so these are the balances that you need when you operate that you want it big enough not too big not too small because you want to address both ease of surgery at the same time concerns or complications of surgery the members can support each other so for example if you have a problem or complication then really it's your team support and you don't want that person to sort of be alone in that situation it it makes it much easier to deal with yourself with the patients and with the whole situation what is then is a disadvantage of having team is not is that you have to take joint decisions you have to work together and sometimes there is a clash the clash may be because of ego because of their different priorities and what they want to do how they want to do it in money aspect about who gets more money who wants to do more surgery and then you have a learning curve so you have to learn to work together mutually help each other instead of fighting to do the surgery against each other right so four aspects to the surgery itself i'm just going to have some water first understand the disease does it need surgery is surgery required or is there a medical option is there any other option can we just wait and observe so understand whether it's an aggressive disease whether we need to be radical in approach or we can just do a debulking and be conservative in approach of course you cannot do any surgery anywhere in the body unless you know anatomy so you must be good at your anatomy both within the nose and in the head you need to be good at the surgical technique and there will always be more than one technique in this surgery right so the more people you see operating the more you will learn the different techniques and you can evolve your own technique using uh, different parts or different techniques from various people and you need to do all this surgery whilst at the same time trying to avoid complications by having benefit to the patient and not any additional morbidity right so for pituitary tumors you have circuitry which may be medical treatment especially prolactinoma surgical treatment for most of the other tumors non circuitry will depend on the on the complaints whether you go in with surgery or not it depends on the location is it easy to operate is a transcranial approach better or is something else the radiotherapy better and what is the size of the of the tumor so is it uh, a micro is there only a cella and very easy to operate is there a big supra cella or a big para cella which then becomes the most difficult situation so where the tumor is apart from its size right so this is going to take you back a little bit in the days when we still were doing a little bit of microscopy 
and this is your microscopic view as compared to the earlier endoscopic view and you can see that it really feels like a very restricted the vision is not anywhere as good and it's a bit of a struggle not just to see the periphery which you can see beautifully as we go back to the endoscopic view but even to work there so i think most people would now agree that uh, for a lot of these situations especially midline tumors that the endoscopy is significantly better both in terms of visualization and having a panorama in terms of magnification and the ability to look around corners that the endoscope scores over the microscope okay so i'm going to take you through a quick old technique which we used to do so we started with the first pituitary in december 99 until 2007 we were doing a uni nostril uh, technique and only after we saw amin and ricardo doing a hadar flap and by nostril in 2007 we then converted to a by nostril so this is how the old uni nostril was we decongest the sphenoethmoid area by lateralizing the turbinus choose the side you would choose a side which is more space so depending on the deviation find the ostium take a downward pointing keresin go into the ostium and just break the bone down all the way to the keel uh this the uh, septal branch would then occasionally of course need to be cauterized once that done we would then take an upward keresin and go across the back of the septum so we would dislocate the septum for the rostrum from the rostrum and go from ostium to ostium to the other side and then we would come down again uh from the opposite ostium back down to the keel on the in this case on the left side so that now the whole center bone or the rostrum could be cleared or removed is it very quick are there and you can see now the opposite side sphenoid coming into the view once that's done you then have a good view now of the entire sphenoid you could take off the mucosa take off the intersphenoid septations uh and come right in once we had a good view over here we were doing what we call then a bone flap technique and this evolved because uh one of the neurosurgeons i worked with uh, dr turel would insist on reconstructing the cella post surgery whether we got a csa or not and so i was finding after doing all this preserving the septum then having to open the septum for some cartilage so we decided to do a bone flap technique which is taking an osteotome and sort of making incisions in the bone all around it now we had to be careful near the cavernous because it is not always possible to control how the bone fractured and you didn't want bleeding from the cavernous and of course not from the ica so we had to leave a little bit of bone at the periphery margin from a safety point of view and uh, i think we were probably one of the first people to to describe this bone flap technique but as is our want uh, for a lot of us in india we failed to publish it uh, but i think those who uh, were there at uh, dr kirtan is uh, meeting in 2004 with stamberger will have seen me doing this uh, exact video even in those days so once all that bone is sort of done then we can just take a hook and reflect it stays attached at the bottom and we just keep it down and we can go ahead with the tumor resection now in this particular case uh, a lot of the tumor was cystic so as soon as we took our incision we got the cystic fluid out and then we could go in and take out the rest of the tumor now essentially it was because of uni nostril essentially it was a single surgeon uh, surgery with one hand so we had to devise things like a suction curette which you can see being used here and occasionally we would try and get in an other hand especially if the tumor was firm or if there was bleeding from the cavernous but there would then be a little bit of clashing of instruments and it was not that easy to have sort of coordination with through one nostril with instrumentation the good thing of this technique is once everything was done and over it was then very easy to just replace this bone flap in position and you could imagine that even if you had a csf leak you would just put a little bit of fat in there flick this bone back into position and overlay it with the fascia and your reconstruction was done in 2 minutes and was is pretty good it was watertight i would think in those days our rates of csf leak were better than it is now with the adart flap but 
essentially because we were more conservative with uh, opening of the area. Right. There's another trick that we employed in those days, which was to use a lumbar drain, especially for large supracellular tumors. And when we couldn't take it out easily, we would push air through the lumbar drain and see what happens. Oh, there's your delivery of your whole tumor. So because today now we do a lot more bone resection, we do a lot of what we call an extended endoscopic approach and remove bone from the tuberculum and supracellar and planum. We now don't need to do this because we can directly under vision remove tumor. But in those days, it was not uncommon for us to use this technique. So one would think maybe for a microadenoma, we can still do a, a uninostal, it's still a good idea because it's just a small tumor. A little word of warning here. Microadenomas for me are more difficult and potentially more dangerous than big macroadenomas. Because your carotids are much closer, your cavernous sinuses are much closer, you want to save all the normal pituitary gland. Uh, you want to remove all the microadenoma at the same time. So you want a complete excision without bleeding, without affecting normal fit, and without having a CSF leak, all working with a narrow space. And I think in this situation, for me, a binostral would actually work better. In fact, I think since 2007, we have never once done a, uh, a uninostral because the neurosurgeon is so much more comfortable using two hands, one from each nostril. And it really works as a proper team effort instead of one surgeon uh, struggling to take it out without having the other hand to, to push away the normal pituitary or to expose the area well to ensure that you've removed completely a microadenoma. All right, so... What do we do now, today? These are our steps, four different steps. When we talk of nasal, we talk of always for us, by nostril, always by nostril. We did experiment a little bit with uh, endoscope holders, but we were not comfortable, both in terms of slight mobility as well as having a very fixed spot. So it's okay if you're doing, for example, a microadenoma, you're doing cervical, actual uh, cervical, or uh, actual or spinal or AAD, so Atlanta actual surgery, where you're in a, in a specific zone, in a specific area. But I think for most skull based transphenoid pathology, we would prefer freehand endoscopy. The posterior septectomy must be adequate enough that there is freedom of movement and it doesn't sort of keep hitting your scope every time. For us, it would mean removing the posterior bony septum and leaving completely intact the cartilage in this part. Again, like in any surgery, exposure is the key. Better the exposure, easier the surgery. At the same time, you don't want to add excess morbidity when you don't need it, right? So we do uh, as wide a sphenoidotomy as possible. If required, a posterior ethmoidectomy, especially if you're doing an EEA, EEA meaning extended approaches, or if you have like an ONOD cell and you can't see the uh, optic nerve, uh, middle turbinate in most pituitaries we do not remove unless we are doing an extended approach. Superior turbinate is not uncommonly removed actually uh, because we may want the additional space for the scope or if you have sphenoid model cells. From the nose you then enter the sphenoid. In the sphenoid what do you want to do? You want to do removal of all the inter and intrasphenoidal septae especially if you are going to be using a flap then you want really a flat surface in there to remove. Mucosa can be removed around the cella if you are not doing a flap. But if you are doing a flap, then you need to remove the entire cella uh, from the floor of the sphenoid right up to the tuberculum. You want to also identify the landmarks clearly. And if they're not well pneumatized, you may want to remove mucosa to make that more prominent. Uh, extent of exposure, so superiorly you want to see tuberculum and a touch of the planum. Laterally you want to see clearly your carotid arteries and be able to move an ipsilateral straight suction to that carotid. So doing a cross is much easier, but ipsilateral is really, that means you have enough space. Inferiorly, you need to be at least two suctions with below the expanded cella. From there, we come to into the cella itself. The dura incision depends on, on, on your neurosurgeon, on, on who you're working with. One of the common incisions for us today is a U-shaped 
lap in which we reflect up. But we've gone from cruciate to cross to beta, theta, you can name the Greek alphabet and we've done those incisions. Extracap versus intracapsular dissection. Again, olden days was always intracapsular. So you went into the center of the, of the cella and you started decompressing. You worked your way first initially inferiorly, then you went laterally, and finally went superiorly, but coming from posterior to anterior to prevent an early descent of the diaphragm, which could occlude your view. Today, we tend to do more of extracapsular because it ensures a uh, a better resection and less chance of leaving residual tumor behind. It does require a little more skill to ensure that you don't get a CSF leak. But thanks to refinements in, in the optical systems, today our views are so much better that we can define the capsule, we can differentiate normal pit from a tumor and get our planes much easier. To remove tumor, we use a combination of dissectors, suctions, curettes, forceps, and this we've already mentioned. Uh, if there is bleeding, initially uh, you can use, of course, uh, gel foam or surgery cell. Cavernous sinus is good to use a, a, a liquid hemostatic like flow seal or surgery flow. Lumbar drain we would use today, not so much for pushing air or saline as we showed earlier, but in the likelihood of there being a large CSF fistula. So if we feel that we have a very big uh, suprastellar extension or it's a revision surgery, in those situations, we're likely to use a lumbar drain. Now, there is one more, one more use of a lumbar drain, which is not universally accepted, but some people like to do it, is that once you get into the cella, I know a couple of my surgeons like to actually drain CSF because it allows the the diaphragm to lift up a little bit so that you can remove tumor without having or without having with having a less chance of having a CSF leak because your diaphragm tends to lift up and not come down. The negative side to doing that, of course, is that it because the diaphragm goes up, the tumor may also go up and make it more difficult because you actually want the diaphragm to come down. And fourth, of course, is the, is the reconstruction. So if you go at uh, go at the, the commonly accepted grades of of reconstruction uh, of CSF leak as an esposito. Zero is no leak. One is a small leak or like a little weeping, a little bit of, you see a little bit of a leak. Two is a moderate CSF leak with an obvious defect. And three is a large CSF leak. So what we would do is in, in a majority of cases where we expect not to have a CSF leak, we would do rescue flaps. If we have a giant adenoma, a, a supracellar component, which is like two centimeters or more, or you require an extended approach where you know you're going to go planar and you're going to have a leak for sure. If the tumor is intradural, then we will start with a nasoceptral, nasoceptral flap or the Haddad flap straight away from the beginning. Okay, so let's come to some tumor surgery as you would do it today. So this is a, like a NOSP. Two, so it's crossing the, the median, uh, median line, but not the lateral. And we don't expect to have a CSF leak here because it's a straight, looks like a straightforward tumor. So surgery starts with lateralization of the turbinates. Inferior is being very important because that provides your access for your instrumentation, going right up to the uh, superior turbinate. Decongest properly the sphenoethmoidal recess. And you would do this on both sides. Uh, once your so let's go a little quicker here. Once your decongestion is done on both sides, we can then do rescue flaps. So rescue flaps are essentially incomplete Haddad flaps. So that's your sphenoid ostium now well visualized with the superior terminal lateralized. So the incisions initially will be the same as that for Haddad, starting just above the eustachian, bottom of the coena, staying low coming across onto the septum and then anteriorly as much as you require. So this inferior incision can be short, can be up to the bone cartilage junction or long, depending on whether you want to deal with a, a septal spur. Like for example, you saw a sharp spur on the opposite side in this patient. The upper incision is at the level of the, just below the olfactory fibers at the level of the sphenoid ostium. And this will come anteriorly more or less to the anterior head of the middle turbinate or to the cartilage and bone junction. 
we also make a small lateral incision there onto the superior turbinate and this allows the flap to come down a little better so we are not sort of obstructed or hindered by the attachment of the flap in this area we can then take the mucoperiosteum off the posterior septum perpendicular plate and vomo all the way inferiorly and using a probe we can maximize that incision to come all the way anteriorly to the bone cartilage junction again of course we would do this on on both sides so the same thing is just being done on the opposite side and uh, even if you have a sharp spur like this the attempt is always to try and elevate without having a tear right it's just practice even though you know you have the opposite side to do a flap and if you can do it with a very tiny sort of tear not hampering the blood supply that part of the flap not being required for the actual reconstruction part you could then even use this side for a flap so once the posterior septum is cleared on both sides of the mucoperiosteum you dislocate the bone from the cartilage and remove the posterior septum and we preferably try and do this in an intact piece so that you can use for bone the use the bone for reconstruction of the of the cella in case of a large csf leak why it's not probably not required in these sort of patients it's good practice so that when you have an ea you now your already your hand is set we're trying to do this once that's done you can take off the rostrum and again we try and do it in a big piece so that we can use that uh, for reconstruction the mucosa is cleared and we can look at the superior, uh, superior turbinates and see whether we need to remove that to enhance our vision of that optic nerve area so in this case you see we are just taking a little bit of that uh, inferior part of the superior turbinate to open into the posterior rhomboid and see the optic nerves clearly on both sides left superior turbinate now just being opened posterior rhomboid on the left side and visualization of the entire area now right up to the uh, tuberculum and a little bit of the cella right so once that's done we we'll go again a little quicker here we now have both surgeons in four hands you can see three instruments in plus the endoscope and it's much quicker than to start drilling and you must sort of flatten this keel down properly so that you want to be comfortably under the cella for a few reasons one is of course to allow instrumentation to occur which is easier in the inferior tunnel but two also in case you need to use a flap it should be able to come in easily we then remove all this bone over the cella all the way up try and maximize your bone removal from cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus on both sides with the tuberculum on top and once you've done that you can then take your incision so here you see the u flap being being taken and then the dura so there are three layers actually there's dura there's normal pit and there's tumor and you must elevate this flap with some part of normal pit in this patient because the tumor is eroded through the bone that differentiation was a little difficult we then have used two hands basically for tumor uh, dissection and resection and you can see the surgeon is trying to find the plane between uh, the, the pseudo capsule and the normal pit and try and remove this big tumor in an extra capsular fashion so once you do that you will see the entire diaphragm and you will see it descending down and you will see the walls of the carotid sinus on both sides clearly once all the tumor is out you you can uh, sort of give a good wash you can use a cotton bud you can use patties to clearly sort of get good hemostasis and retract the diaphragm and and structures away to ensure that everything is seen clearly so we are using a cotton bud both to scrape off any res residual tumor as well as for retraction no csf leak so you just get a small piece of surgi selin and uh, gel foam comes on top instead of being in the cella so there is no fear of overpacking or expansion of the gel foam and then a uh, big advantage of doing the rescue flaps you see that we can just replace the flaps back in position because these flaps are all intact the middle turbinates come back to the center <clears throat> and even in a couple of weeks it will be very difficult for anyone to know that this patient had surgery endoscopic endonasal surgery because the morbidity is now reduced there are no raw areas really no packing required in this situation and most important is that your flap has remained viable and vital for a future surgery in case it's required 
So let's go there from a more, to a more difficult case. So this is a, a NOS4 where you see encasement of the carotid artery and the tumor being essentially center and, and right side. So here, because we have a much larger tumor, we will do a, a, a nasoceptral flap. So we are going to start off with, again, as you saw initially with the lateralization and, and uh, uh, identification of ostea. The incision starts similarly, and then we come onto the floor as we come anteriorly. And the width will depend on how wide a flap you want. This incision is the same to the cartilage bone junction where it swings upward as high as you can go towards the septal valve, as anterior as you can come right up to the mucocutaneous junction. You join these two incisions and then you can elevate the flap backward. Opposite side is what we call the reverse flap. So you cut off the back uh, part, have it anterior pedicled. We do a, a posterior septectomy. And you can then bring in your uh, reverse flap from this side and cover all the bare cartilage. So this means your recovery is much quicker. We then have a nice look once you remove the anterior wall of sphenoid. You see the uh, carotid optic OCR on the left side. On the right, because we want a view of the cavernous carotid and laterally as well, we'll go all the way to the orbital apex. So you see uh, a much wider view. You can facilitate this view by doing a middle turbinectomy or even a full ethmoidectomy so that you have a good control of this area. Because we are going to go lateral to the carotid or expose the carotid, your exposure has to be good enough not just to remove the tumor, but to deal with a potential complication. So in case you have bleeding from the carotid, your exposure should be so wide that you don't have difficulty in handling that. Again, you see, uh, as you go dissecting the dura off from the tumor, ensuring that the character is not close to it before using a scissor to cut it. The center part of the tumor is then removed. We can go a little quicker, you've seen all this. And you have the carotid artery on the right side. So again, we'll remove a little more tumor in the center, whatever tumor is there going towards the left. And now you see we're going to the right. This is the carotid artery in the clival part and the cavernous part. And we are now completely lateral to it where the, the tumor had entered into the lateral cavernous area. So for this sort of patient, this is the dura of the posterior fossa now coming into view, a posterior part. And you must have a Doppler when you're doing this kind of surgery so that you have clear idea of where the carotid is going to be before you make incisions. So again, that was the carotid, entire tumor removed, and the optic now, small CSF leak. So we put in a little bit of fat, and then we can put in our, uh, sorry, we didn't have a CSF fat, but because we had, the dura was sort of pulsating, we tended to close it with the flap since you already had it, and covered it with this. Also, when you have an exposed carotid, it's a good idea to use a flap to cover it in position. Right, so let's go to, what is the sort of not dictum, but more popular word today is the extra capsular dissection is to find the pseudo capsular plane. So small incision, get the dura up, get the normal pituitary up and then find the plane before you take it out. Two ways to do an extra capsular. One is to decompress the center part so that the bulk of the tumor is, is less and you can then, it becomes easier to, uh, to find the plane. I'm just going to go a little quicker with, the, with that. Uh, that's your incision being taken. And then find the plane from inferior and sort of work your way back from inferior to lateral to, to superior, much like you used to do with uh, the intracapsular technique. A second way is that if you find your plane anteriorly is to go superior initially and then come from anterior to posterior. And you can even do a combination. So you see now you've got a nice plane here and you're able to hold the, the tumor and dissect. So even though he's using a, a curette, it's actually the curette is being used as a dissector, not to curette the tumor, but just to dissect the tumor away from the normal gland. So you could even use a combination. So if you have some bit of anterior dissection done, you can then go back, see the normal pituitary at the back, and then communicate the two planes in case you tend to lose plane. When you have very large tumors, you sometimes need to remove it in, in pieces instead of removing the whole tumor at one go. And this is not a problem as long as you don't lose your plane while you're removing it.
So that's now a big chunk of the tumor being cleared and you can see how the extracapsular dissection system works. So that's the tumor now coming out. Right. So what are the problems that you can face with this kind of surgery? One, it requires a learning curve. So of course you need to have some experience. <clears throat> Sorry. You need, <coughs> you need to have experience as you go from level one to level five in surgeries. You do need to have the right equipment and the right instrument, the right scissors or the right bipolar just makes your surgery much easier and, and less chance of having a complication. Don't think that it makes your surgery quick. Endoscopic surgery done well can actually take a longer time. Exposure may take a long time. And your two surgeons must be tuned, must be good friends before they can start doing this surgery together. So there are some situations which are more difficult than others, especially if you have fibrous tumors or the vessels are encased, if it's gone in paracellar or the intradural. Revision surgery is always difficult, always difficult, no matter how easy it looks. So very quickly, we'll try and finish this because I think we have very little time left. Uh, but for this tumor with a subfrontal approach, we need an extended approach. So here we're going to drill not just the cella, but also the uh, planum. And that's bone being removed from the tuberculum and the planum. We then take our incisions, coagulate the intercavernous sinus, and then open the uh, dura and the... So this is now the supracellar dura. So once your cellar dura is, is cleared, you can remove a supracellar tumor by removing or opening up that part of the dura. So you can see now quite a large chunk of tumor, sorry, quite a large chunk of tumor that will come out from that supracellar area. And once all this is done, of course, you will have a great view of the intracranium and all the vessels and brain and everything. Be careful, you don't damage perforators. And then comes the difficult part. The most difficult part of these surgeries is the reconstruction. Ensuring a watertight seal so that you don't have the possibility of a CSF leak and, and uh, meningitis. So we close this patient using uh, fat. We use bone from the anterior wall of the sphenoid. And then on top of it, we put in a, a nasoceptral flap. That's the flap wing right on top. And then some fat on top of it. So this is an unusual tumor. It looked like a pretty simple, straightforward tumor. And we exposed it, we, we took our incision. And then when we tried to remove it, we found that it was just very vascular and very firm. So every time we tried using a, a curette, it would just bleed. So we did what at that time we thought was pretty much the unthinkable. We used a coblator. So we, and it, it helped us in two ways. It helped us debulk the tumor and also gave us hemostasis, which we were not able to get any other way. And because we had quite a wide tumor in there, we knew that the posterior wall was far away. We started debulking it with a, a, a coblator, and this is the actual part. And of course, the first time we were doing something like this, we were a little scared, we were worried, and we kept going back to the curate to see if, now have we got a soft part? Is it now easier to remove? And the answer was no every time. You see, we're even using through cut forceps to try and remove this tumor. It's so hard, so vascular that every time we had to just go back to the... And then as time went, we just got a little more comfortable with, with the coblator. We stayed away from the lateral walls where the carotids are. We knew we had to stop before, as soon as we got a little bit of release and the tumor stopped feeling firm. Uh, we did have navigation so we could control how far we were posteriorly. And this was quite a learning experience even for us so that um, at the end of it, we were able to get quite a good tumor removal and uh, identify the, the carotids on, on both sides. So it's going to go a little quicker. And then at some point, of course, that's the carotid now coming into view on the right. Uh, once we had enough of debulk, uh, debulking done, we then decided to call it a day. Right, so for reconstruction, uh, we've gone through the nasoceptral flap and uh, you've seen that the incision to take is from Osteum anteriorly goes all the way up to the nasoceptral valve area, inferiorly comes across the lower part of the coena, anteriorly joins up the mucoclinus junction, 
and then we uh, elevate the flap. So again, staying low below the olfactory filament till you come to the cartilage part, then you swing it right up as high as you can go. So you have as wide a flap as possible, as anterior as possible, communicate the two and elevate it, leaving an attached posterior laterally to the septal branch of the sphenopalatine. And once that's done, once your tumor is out, so I'm just gonna go quicker here. Uh, you can then, uh, <clears throat> different ways to close the leak. In this case, you use fat, which is I think, if a small leaks, we just put in a little fat and a little fascia if required. For moderate leaks, we will put in a flap and uh, a flap. And for large grade three leaks, we will put in a flap and a, a lumbar drain. So that would be our protocol for reconstructions. So I think, uh, not sure whether we got, okay, we got five minutes. So this was a multi-layer closure. So again, let's go a little quicker with all this part. Uh, it looked a little suspicious because of this ring enhancement. And when we uh, sort of took our incision, we got a lot of uh, pus. So it, it looked a bit like a pituitary abscess, but we weren't quite sure. And uh, we, we removed everything. And, and actually while it was all adherent and while trying to remove the last bit of the wall, we had a big deficient diaphragm. So now we had this big hole uh, in the diaphragm. You can see the uh, optic chiasm and uh, the anterior cerebral complex, a uh, young girl. And we decided to do a multi-layer closure on this patient. So I was going to replace every layer. So we converted our rescue into a Haddad flap, first of all, because we knew we'll need the flap. Uh, whereas the original plan was just to do uh, a rescue. So our first layer was an underlay fascia. So this fascia sort of substituted the diaphragm. On top of this fascia, we then put in a blob of fat to keyhole the fascia in position. And that flap then replaced the pituitary gland. We then went and put another layer of underlay fascia on top of the fat, which then replaced the outer dura. So we were replacing layer for layer. On top of this, we would then put in a piece of large piece of bone. To use bone, it has to impact. You cannot have a bone smaller. It has to be the right size and has to impact, jam into position. So this replaced the anterior cellar wall. And then on top of that, we put in the flap to replace the mucosa. So we actually reconstituted every layer that we had removed and we were able to get a good uh, closure. We would not normally do this, show this thing, but because we had a very large defect, we thought we'll do this. So what happens you're doing a revision surgery here and you get a, a reasonably large defect. So you don't have a flap. So we then did in this patient what we call a lateral nasal vault flap. So we are taking our incision. The pedicle will still be a branch, the lateral branch of the sphenopalatine. But above the inferior turbinate, the lateral nasal wall coming anterior, stopping just short of the piriform aperture. If you don't want a very wide flap, you can just come to the inferior part of the inferior turbinate. If you want a wider flap, you can come right down to the floor. Because in this case, we didn't need that much more. We just elevated the mucoperiosteum off that inferior turbinate and the lateral nasal wall. And the important thing is that when you do this, to keep that pedicle alive, which is the branch of the sphenopalatine. So as you elevate posteriorly, you have to identify the crista and the sphenopalatine branch. So let's come there. Okay, so now we have a lot of this pedicle exposed. Uh, and maxilla is open till you can see clearly where you are. So it's a very nice big sort of branch, a big flap and can be used for covering. A problem with this, and now you see of course the crista and just behind that, you see the pedicle of the flap. So once you identify this pedicle, you can then continue incision over and posterior to it. Because now you know that this vasculature is intact. So once you've elevated it, you can rotate it then into position. So I'm just going to put a little bit of fat in that cellar. And then we will rotate uh, 
our flap into position. So this is a lateral nasal wall flap or what we call a reserve flap in case the, the regular nasal septal flap is not available. Reserve flaps can be taken from the lateral wall or from the turbinate, inferior or middle turbinate. And you see it's nice wide, even though I didn't come to the floor. Reserve flaps. So what is the future hold for us? Targeted gene therapy, nasal protection devices to make the surgery less morbid, tumor fluorescence so that you can target the tumor, you know, for any uh, residual interop imaging, which does not, is not time consuming like it is today. Better reconstruction materials uh, which are pliable and yet firm. And we're going to go towards seven Tesla MRIs. So you're going to get a far more detail. For me, one of the most important slides of this presentation and the reason why we must work as a team so that in case you get complications, your team can manage it effectively and efficiently without any issues. So sometimes your diaphragm is very weak and your uh, repontine cistern may collapse. You want to then pack this to prevent an empty cella. Vascular injuries, uh, fortunately, are not very uh, common, but when it happens, it can be de devastating and you have to be ready to sort of control it. For us, crushed muscle works very well. In this case, we were doing a revision GH and while uh, removing a little bit of tumor near the carotid, uh, we got a little small bleed from the carotid. So I'll come straight to that part. Okay, so here. And this was just a little scraping of the tumor of the carotid. And you can see yet with that even tiny hole, how profuse the bleeding is. And it's very important that you keep your cool in this situation. Both the surgeons must be relaxed at the same time. The anesthetist must get fluids pumped in, mobilize the blood, make sure that the blood pressure stays okay. Take all those measures and then localize the site of bleeding. So you may use two suctions to triangulate, put in a patty there, get control. And then if it's a very small thing in this case, for example, we were able to just put in a little bit of, uh, sneak in some surgery cell under the patty. And this requires very fine hand movements. And Dr. Dev Pujari was with me on this day, uh, being able to control it very well and sneak that surgery cell in to the extent that we were able to control that ICA bleed just with surgery cell. So patty being taken away. And then we just put in a little bit of uh, fascia on top to sort of add a little more solidity to that part. This patient will have an intra-op uh, angio, another angio a week later and then a month later to look for a pseudo aneurysm, which is very likely to happen. CSF leaks, as you can see, uh, the, the bigger the grade, the higher the risk of having a CSF leak. Uh, smaller grade also, there's significant interop chances. These are interop leaks. And uh, the rates of post-op leaks, of course, are not as, as much. And you can see it's only 0.6 to 5%. Again, higher in the grade uh, three leaks. So if there is no leak, you don't need to pack it. A small leak, we would put fat fascia glue, moderate leak, as above with a flap, large leak as above with a lumbar drain. Other complications include hemorrhage and swelling if it's incompletely removed, and that can be again a catastroph catastrophic. Uh, DI, which is not so uncommon, yeah, 10 to 60 percent temporary, uh, hypopit, uh, ADH issues, and electrolyte disturbances, again, which can come up five, six days later. So you think you're happy to send your patient home and he comes back drowsy look for electrolytes. We've done 1200 cases now of pituitary surgery in the last whatever, 20, 21 years. And again, I thank uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, Dr. Turel, Dr. Sunil Shah, Dr. Uday Andar, uh, Mahesh Chaudhary, uh, Dr. Neera Mehta, so many different surgeons uh, that we've really worked with, Vikram Karmarkar, uh, I think, and a lot of foreign international surgeons who come for our workshops uh, that have really been instrumental in us learning our technique. Two of the most important people for me have been Amin and Ricardo, uh, from whom we developed most of our techniques. And they were kind enough to write the, uh, the forewords to our book on uh, practical aspects, a practical guide to transphenoidal surgery. 
So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I think we have a little time now so we can take questions uh, once I go off this. Our workshop for this year has been postponed. Uh, we don't know whether we will be able to have it. It all depends on the present COVID situation. Uh, I do hope that uh, most of you or all of you are safe. For those involved in frontline uh, assistance or working in COVID hospitals, especially a young generation, our gratitude uh, and appreciation of the work that you're doing. Be strong, be brave, but also be safe. Uh, for future, for those uh, young students interested in fellowships with us to learn skull-based surgery, uh, you could send me your CVs to this email and uh, as and when the opportunity or the time opens, we will uh, do interviews for you. We would prefer uh, uh, candidates who are less than three, four years from post MS or post DNB. So we don't want very senior people. Right. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, if there is now, I'll just try and see if they have already some questions on on the chat. Then we'll we'll look at that initially. Okay. So I'm going to start with the initial questions here. Uh, okay, so our first question is from Neeraj Sharma. What is the anterior limit of the posterior septectomy? So Neeraj, this depends uh, on person to person. There are people who like a very small posterior septectomy. They will do a very small rescue flap, just lower it down and be happy to walk from that area. Uh, we like the moderate sort of one where we come do the entire bone work. And some people would like to take the cartilage as well so that they have a really wide big uh, septectomy especially if you need to go very lateral or across like you're doing a lateral recess phenoid or or uh, infratemporal work then your septectomy may come a little more anterior so do your septectomy as is convenient for you and your partner that makes it easier uh, for surgery at the same time not adding morbidity uh, next question from rajad <clears throat> Does only tumor removal happen when you instilled air or water through the lumbar drain? So Rajat, like we mentioned, uh, this was something we used to do in the past. Prior to EEAs, prior to doing extended approaches. Uh, today, I, I think in the last maybe seven, eight years, I don't think uh, we have now done... Uh, we have done anything... Sorry, I'm just gonna shut this off. I don't think we have done maybe one patient at all where we've instilled a little bit of air, but we've stopped using this because we have the opportunity to do an extended bone work, which we were scared to do earlier. We didn't know how to repair or reconstruct. The flap has added so much advantage and so much more safety, insurance, security to us that we're happier to do bone work and remove it directly. So we don't do so much air water installation now. What's your experience with bilateral Haddad? Uh, honestly, I don't like the concept of a bilateral Haddad because it means that your septectomy has, is, your septum is almost gone completely. So you're going to be left with a big empty nose. So for me, I would then, if, if required, I would do a Haddad and then use a, 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 a reserve flap, either a lateral nasal wall or a turbinate flap or a pharyngeal flap as an extra flap instead of using a bilateral Haddad. We have done... Uh, Maybe on a, on, a, on a very big CSF, iatrogenic bilateral CSFs, we did a bilateral Haddad, but they were not uh, completely anterior. And that surgeon had anyway made a big septal perforation uh, initially. So that's the only patient I remember where we used a, a bilateral Haddad. Uh, can kusa be used instead of coblation? Yes, sure. Uh, we now have good nasal kusas. KUSA can also be used for bone work. In fact, the, the KUSA strength can be adjusted. And for fibrous tumors, we have used KUSAs as well. And sure enough, we can use KUSA. We actually didn't show you, but we did try KUSA as well in, in this patient, but we were not very happy. And because we had a wide tumor with depth that we sort of thought of using a, a coblator. 
Uh, Vaishnav is asked which coblator wand did we use? Uh, so this was the the regular. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the E the E E seventy whatever it's called the, the regular one that we use for uh, tonsil surgery. Uh, not the uh, max, not the precise max. So not the precise max. Uh, would you like to use coblator in normal endopit? So we do use coblator a lot in nasal surgery, especially when we're doing nasal tumors. Uh, we have a, a, quite a large experience with different types of nasal tumors, both benign and malignant, and we tend to use the coblator more and more. Uh, Intracranially, really, that is the only situation where we use it. We tend not to use a coblator intracranially, but within the nose, sure, we use a lot of the coblator. Uh, that was Varun Jairat. Uh, Rajat, again, while using fat for reconstruction, should be used along with surgery cell or simply fat? So, again, Rajat, good question. And I know for normal CSF leaks, a lot of surgeons like to sort of pack up that fat in surgery cells so that it can be pushed into a hole into as, and as a plug. In pituitary, generally, we don't tend to do that uh, because already you have a big defect and a clearly visible uh, dural defect. So it's quite easy to put the uh, fat or plug the fat in there without using a surgery cell, but it's your choice. If you want to, you can use it. There's no, no problem there. Vaishnavi, again, if by chance we damage the... Uh, so palatine artery, then what do we do? Right, so if you're assuming you've done uh, the flap on one side and you damaged it while, you, while doing that, then you have the option of using the opposite side hadad, even if it means a big septum, uh, septectomy. The other option is if suppose it happens later in the surgery. So you've done a reverse flap on the opposite side, you've cut off the SPA, or you need to do a a trans uh, pterygoid or a trans uh, cavernous approach. And you don't have the option of using the opposite side flap. Then you can either do a, a, a reserve flap from the lateral nasal wall or still use that flap as a free flap because it's, it's mucoperiosteum. So instead of taking fascia, you can use it as a free flap and hope that it does well, even though it's devascularized. Right, so I'm not sure if we have any more questions here. Uh, I can't see any more questions. Okay, we got Karan uh, Al Jaberi, transnasal or transethmoid. So I'm not sure what the question is, but uh, I think for pituitary, almost always we would go endonasal. We don't do transethmoid. I, I mentioned that I know one surgeon who, who still goes transethmoid, but I think. That's an exception. It's a very rare person that would go today uh, transethmoid. Of course, some people, macroscope surgeons, would go transseptal or trans uh, sublabial, but not, not uh, ethmoid. Neera Sharma, CT scan PNS shows us the highway to the cella. Yeah, that's quite right. It's, the, it's your map, it's your road, it's your guide to the cella, and it's important that you have the CT. Uh, so, this is something that you, when you work as a team, you realize that. With the neurosurgeons, they've been so adapted with microscopy just to do an MRI because they know they're just going transseptal that they would have earlier days tended not to do a CT. So because we are doing endoscopy now, we have to go uh, back and back to uh, reminding to do a septum, uh, a CT scan. Okay, we got a question from uh, Brihaspati Sigdel. I think uh, Brihaspati is from Nepal. Which step of surgery you use coblation? Uh, so generally, Sigdal, uh, we use coblation in the nose as an hemostatic tool, more than a cutting tool. So for taking the flaps, I prefer to use uh, the Colorado needle or the monopolar needle, which is just bent at 70 degrees at its tip. And uh, we use the coblator essentially for hemostasis or for like removing the inferior part of the superior turban, for example. So steps like that, which are anterior uh, to the cella, but not so much within it. But when we're doing nasal tumor surgery, we tend to use a lot more of uh, the coblator. Uh, Dilip Babu, uh, macroadenomas require extra capture dissection and macroadenomas require 
So again, uh, same thing, Dilip, microadenoma, probably even more important to do an extra capsula because it's essential that we have an endocrine cure. With a macro, with a macro the decompression is more essential. And so you, even if you leave a little, your objective of surgery is achieved. With the micro, it's a secretory. If you leave a little bit of tumor behind, your objective is not achieved. So it's even more important to have an extra capsula when you have a microadenoma surgery. Okay. So uh, I think we are now more or less to the end of this. Uh, again, let me thank the uh, Orient platform for having organized uh, this talk and thank you to everyone uh, for being here today. And uh, let's hope we meet again soon and, and things look up and brighter and happier for everyone across the world. Thank you so much.